Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Anthony Mead, and I'm the director of the Moreland Gallery here at Transylvania University. And with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest tonight, Lisa Walcott. Lisa is one of seven artists who currently have work in Moreland Gallery in our exhibition, Subtle, which is on view to the public from uh, September 7th when it started until October 8th. Please feel welcome to come by um, between Monday and Friday, uh, between nine or between noon and five to see the exhibition if you haven't already, or if you would like a second look. For those of you who may not have been to Moreland in a while due to the pandemic, um, please note that masks are required anywhere on Transylvania University's campus, including in the gallery. If this is your first time joining us, for one of our virtual artist talks, welcome. And let me give you a lay of the land. We do have closed captioning available. Uh, and to turn that on, if you'd like to use it, you can take your cursor down to the bottom of the browser window and you can click on the little CC icon. Also down at the bottom of the browser window, you will find a Q&A button. You can use the Q&A button to enable a chat function and that will allow you to type your questions. Uh, you can feel free to type those at any time and we will reserve some time after Lisa speaks um, to have a Q&A session where I will read those questions to our guest. Lisa Walcott joins us tonight from Holland, Michigan, where in addition to making the wonderful and thoughtful work that we have in the gallery. She is an assistant professor of art in the area of sculpture at Hope College. She received her MFA in sculpture from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2010 and has since created and exhibited her work nationally, including at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, Ohio, the Sadie Haley Project in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum in East Lansing, Michigan, and attended residencies at Oxbow School of Art, Acre, and Three Walls. Lisa's work in installation and kinetic sculpture translates elements of daily life. As viewers, we find ourselves oddly connected to these works through our familiarity with materials, things like raw wood, curtains, and soap bubbles. That familiarity allows openness and awareness to emotions, sensations, monotony, and cycles of change as they carry out various subtle gestures, visually articulating the unsaid. At the same time that these works use a visual language of poetry, they also speak with humor. More than once, I've heard a viewer in the gallery exclaim with delight, they're bubbles as they discover the work, maybe it's supposed to, or have found someone pleasurably entranced by the relaxing and mildly absurd action of an implied breeze as curtains controlled by a motor and strings mechanically blow in the wind in the work thin air. As we continue to navigate these disorienting times in our lives, Lisa's work gives us a space to consider, relax, and find moments of surprise and joy. Everyone, please join me in virtually welcoming Lisa Walcott. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thanks for the beautiful introduction and also for including um, my work in, in your exhibition. So wish that I could see it. It looks amazing online, but I'm sure it's the type of exhibition that is really great in person. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and get started um, with a presentation about my work. All right. Um, I did kind of a survey. Um, prepared a, uh, sorry, a lecture, kind of a, just a survey of my work, just so I think sometimes in the academic setting and for students, I like to show sort of where the work came from. Um, so the first slide I have here is from my um, 
my studio in grad school. And I, I've always been a very active maker, but very process oriented. So what I'm doing in this screen here um, or in the slide is I'm coating balloons with all kinds of things like glue and plaster and things, and then I'm popping the balloons. And then I end up with this kind of um, coated shard <laughs> type of thing. Um, and I, well, okay, let me, I'll move beyond that in just a minute. So that's just kind of like um, keeping a lot of the magic for myself at that point in the process. Um, I was also making this photography series where I would kind of um, find spaces that existed on um, between the pages of fashion magazines. They're such surreal spaces created on each side. And then when you put them up to the light and combine them, I was just interested that it wasn't Photoshop doing this, that this was something that I could um, seek and find and that it was kind of this in-between thing that you had to pay attention to. Um, all kinds of strange combinations can happen um, there. And then um, an artist that I was looking at at that time as well was Renika Dykstra. I think um, a lot of my writing about my work was about the in-between and the spaces that couldn't be captured. And I thought this work was really beautiful in the way that um, her subjects are neither young nor old. They're not on land and they're not in water. They're naked, not naked, they're not clothed. They're kind of like embodying this, these images just completely embody the idea of in, in between. Um, I was able, so this was still when I was in grad school, I was able to show at the Russell Industrial in okay. Detroit. Oh my, okay. My watch just sent a message about what I said on that, um, on that slide. Anyways, <laughs> that was strange. Sorry about that. Um, so this was a piece where I actually did something similar to what you saw in that first slide where I coated the balloons in kind of this um, resin and glue mixture that I had made up for myself. Um, and then I had them actually popping or like deflating slowly during the opening. And that was the first time that I actually shared with the audience what I was enjoying in the studio. Because a lot of times when I would show, um, you know, something like the image on the right in critique, I didn't feel like people were as connected to what I was doing as I was. And that's because I had been experiencing the deflation and, and you know, all the process. Um, so this was my first time kind of sharing that process. Um, I guess you could call it maybe my first kinetic sculpture. Um, another artist I was looking at at the time, Eva Hesse, um, her idea of not necessarily worrying about whether or not the art would last and using materials that um, would intentionally break down. And I think her quote is that um, when you use materials that are unstable, it relates to life. And I've definitely taken um, that kind of idea into my studio as well. This is my first um, mechanized sculpture. So I guess the balloons were kind of kinetic in, in that they were moving. Um, but this, I had a lot of um, pieces around my studio. I had laser cut these um, little pull string tips and I was interested in the poetry of that kind of um, pull strings that could turn a light on and off. And I had them all knotted up in the bottom of the studio and then I was hanging them all over the place. And at one point over breakfast, I drew the, the pull string. I'm like, what do I do with these things? And then I drew the arrow up and down and I was like, of course they need to be moving. Um, so I installed them on the wall. They kind of look like drips a little bit. Um, this machine was incredibly crude. I think it included a sour cream lid and like a nail and a motor that I borrowed from someone else. Um, lots of good energy, maybe not the most stable um, installation right there. Um, but yeah, that was maybe the point where planning kind of met my, my love of um, manipulating material and process. And I, I felt like something really successful happened there. Um, and so I definitely have pursued that in the studio since then. One more artist, I don't have too many more in here. Um, Robert Gober is another artist I was looking at um, in the way that he can create um, metaphor within objects. And so this, this piece, um, it is basically a sink, but it's a handcrafted sink. Um, that he made himself and the the spaces and the dark, um, the drain, you know, becomes almost like autobiographical or metaphorical for like the darkness of a person. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting the way he was able to translate an everyday household object into something, um, something autobiographical and metaphorical. Uh, around this same time, um, 
I started making drawings. It's not a bad idea for sculptors to make drawings. For one thing, you can think on paper differently than you can with your um, three-dimensional building. Um, so as a way of brainstorming, but also even just um, supplementing the process. Uh, a lot of my work isn't very collectible. Um, a lot of it's really ephemeral. So it's kind of nice to have these things on the side that um, are about the work, but it's something that someone could take home with them. Um, what I was doing here was um, I was sitting at home, this is in grad school still, um, and I was taking in the sounds and the sights and the temperature and the even just my imaginings about my domestic space. So it was kind of a brainstorming process for me in a way when I was trying to think about what sculpture I wanted to make. Um, but then also just practicing these kind of marks on the page. Um, so you can see things building up and tearing down, heating and cooling, light and dark, twitches and stillness, piles are expanding and contracting. Early on, they all looked pretty different, um, and I still I still make these on occasion. Um, so it's a it's an over ten year series at this point where um, it's 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 kind of a meditation map making process that I I enjoy engaging in. This piece called "Bless You" um, kind of hard to see in the initial part of the video here, but it will zoom in in just a second. It's basically a clock pendulum. Um, embedded into a wooden box. And then at the bottom there, you can see a little pile of pepper and a feather. So I'm kind of riffing off of the idea of um, time passing and this kind of regulated thing, but then also thinking a lot about sensation. Um, the feathers kind of tickling and dancing, and you might think about sneezing, um, especially in like a cartoon with like the pepper or the feather. So I'm kind of playing around with the idea of um, how to capture a sensation within a, a sculpture. Another piece, um, this is just a mock-up for, I, I was interested in double dutch and that motion, um, seeing if there's any way I could possibly make a sculpture like that. Um, kind of representing playfulness, of course, right? This is like a, like a playground game. Um, but then also um, thinking about the defined space in the center of these ropes spinning and how that's, you know, kind of loaded. Um, and then also the positions where the, the people spinning the jump ropes would be standing. Um, and I did realize a larger version of that as well. I chased this idea pretty hard. I'm mean, gonna be honest with you, I really didn't know what I was doing. So every step of the way I was learning something brand new. Um, most of the metalwork was, was something I had to learn in order to do this. Um, I had some laser cut gears made that I figured out how to do that. Um, of course I had access to those things because I was in school. Um, but that was just a really fun and semi-frustrating project that um, was was interesting to kind of just chase this idea of playful negative space. Um, another artist who deals with loaded negative space or actually solid negative space is Rachel Whiteread. Um, she highlights the overlooked or the unseen. In this case, these are um, the it's the space between library bookshelves, and she casts them often in concrete or plaster. And so she's taking what would be empty and she's turning them into a form. Um, obviously an idea that I've been kind of interested in as well. I got the pull strings off the wall at this point. Um, I do like to show how um, sophisticated my machine making skills are here. Um, that's sarcastic. Um, so I think that's a plumbing part attached to the shaft. I didn't really know how to attach anything to the shaft. So I went to Menards or Home Depot or wherever, and I was just kind of looking for something that might work. Um, and then, yeah, you need it to get into the space. So it's, you know, wood. And then actually um, this piece right here is a zip tie. So that had the right amount of flexibility. And then the string comes down from here and then that's an actual pull string tip. So instead of kind of this up and down on the wall uh, motion, in this case, it was a lot more like maybe someone had just pulled it. So I was kind of playing with that idea of presence um, that maybe someone had just been there uh, a moment before. 
And then this was my thesis piece for grad school. This was installed at um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Um, something happened to my slide today. These are actually supposed to be videos, but I guess they're still, so I can still describe what's happening here. Um, this is a 10 by 10 foot platform made out of old barn wood that I got from one of the architectural salvages in town. Um, and then I added four kind of small gestures on top of this platform. Um, through a knot in the floor, I had bubbles emerging, um, kind of similar to what's happening in your gallery, only um, a, a much larger, larger um, bunch there. This bucket right here is catching a drip from the ceiling. I actually insp installed a small dehumidifier that was taking the moisture out of the air and then dripping it into the bucket. And then I had a heat element under that that was kind of evaporating it back into the air. So again, this idea of um, the unseen and kind of thinking about you know the moisture in the air. Um, this is the pull string, like what you saw before, um, only it's installed in a, I want to say probably 20 foot ceiling, something like that. So the line was really beautiful the way that it extended all the way up into the ceiling. Um, and then this was a, a smoking cigarette, um, which in that case, before I had explored many options, I actually had an entire fog machine installed under the floor and I had like sealed it all up and it was on a timer. Um, it was pretty makeshift, but it, it did have the effect that I wanted it to, um, which was a constantly um, smoking cigarette, which has that idea to um, like the pull string of presence. Maybe someone was just there, that kind of idea of being like hot on the scent of, of a person. Um, I, I titled it No Vacancy just because even though there's a lot of space within the piece, I thought the space was really full based on kind of the way that these um, four gestures kind of alluded beyond themselves. Another piece that has that kind of human presence, this time using a humidifier. So that worked a little better um, than the fog machine. <laughs> Not much. Um, I have better solutions at this point, but I, I built this little countertop to kind of match what was already in the gallery space. Um, and then just installed this black coffee cup um, that has a hole in the bottom connected to a space that's really humid. Uh, but it definitely, it's creepier <laughs> than maybe it, it appears because um, I had even gallery workers come to me and say, I really thought that was real. And then it stayed hot for so long. So again, it's kind of that, um, that moment in time, almost like a photograph, but then it exists in real life, which has this kind of, um, uncanny element, but also um, maybe something sort of peaceful. Maybe it reminds you of, um, of your coffee cup or something like that. I don't do performance pieces all that often. Um, every once in a while, I have an idea that I'm interested in and I kind of follow it. Um, for this piece, I exhibited at a gallery in Chicago um, in a show called H.O. and Casa. So it was about the, the homemade. Um, and I decided to create a scenario where I made as much bread as I could during the opening. Um, so once again, I had um, a platform installed, um, this time mainly to kind of contain the performance, but then it also creaked. Um, so every time I needed the bread dough, um, there was a creak under my feet. And I just kind of set up a scenario where I would, you know, take the the teapot and heat up the water until I could get the yeast going. And I would just make as much bread dough as I possibly could. Um, so kind of this idea about um, growth and cycles and work and labor, and then um, maybe the way that things accumulate from that process. Um, so the dough I had, I was kind of putting it into this little trash can on the side, and it did make this really amazing mound. Um, at one point, someone asked if they could touch it, and I said, hey, sure, no problem. Um, and then after that, it turned into this kind of sagging, um, clumpy mound, which was my fault for saying yes, I guess, because I really wanted it to be this very, um, like growing mound next to me. So I should have, I should have not let people touch the dough, probably. <laughs> This time um, I, went, I did an exhibition at Land of Tomorrow, um, actually in Louisville. Um, the gallery is no longer open, but it was a really amazing space um, in the old YMCA downtown. Um, and this time I, I installed in the entire room 
Um, so I put a floor in that people could walk on. Um, I probably didn't say that, but the thesis piece, people could not walk on the floor. So I was interested in allowing the viewer to stand on the platform, which kind of serves as a pedestal um, in the conversation of sculpture. The pedestal has a, a lot to say. Um, so people could walk around and the floor would creak and they could kind of discover, um, again, another four gestures. Um, let's see if I can get that to play. Um, so this time I had two elements that were similar. Um, and then I had it in the wall, I installed this brown paper bag that looked like it was breathing um, or hyperventilating, whatever you might <laughs> think is happening there. And then there was a mobile above um, that had just one little piece, one sinker with black wax on it that kind of buzzed around like a fly. Um, I was thinking about this piece really differently than the original thesis piece, even though there's some similar elements. Um, that time I was, the first time I was trying to capture presence, and this time I thought, what would it be like to try to capture a mood? Um, so I was thinking about um, maybe what it's like to, it, it's called my pleasure. So what it's like to be polite but anxious at the same time. I don't know if you guys consider yourself Midwesterners, but I think as a, a Michigander, we tend to um, smile and be nice, maybe even more than we should. So I was just kind of playing with that idea of, of being happy and polite, but then maybe also feeling agitation underneath that. I don't think I make work like Cy Twombly, um, a wonderful painter, um, drawer, sculptor. Um, one thing I like to look at is the way he creates his compositions on the page. And I think about my gallery space in a similar way. So when I'm, um, when I'm composing an exhibition or a piece like this, I'm thinking about where my marks are going to be in kind of the composition. So um, yeah, this is kind of the awkwardly wonderful compositions that he creates that I kind of um, find inspiration in. This is a piece I made in the old Grand Rapids Public Museum um, for Art Prize in, uh, let's see, I think it was in 2012, yeah. Um, this was the taxidermy suite for the Public Museum, so they would make um, exhibitions that um, were prepared in this room, right? So lots of um, prep happening here. And so I opened up the space and I installed a floor and then I did multiple bubbles. So it's kind of a version of the other pieces um, and I do that a lot in my work. I like to kind of continue to expand pieces. So I'll try something small. I'll see what happens when I make it big. I'll recombine um, different gestures together. Um, that quirky video you just saw was my inefficient installation process there. Um, and then this is what the piece looked like. So you could walk through the space. And Art Prize, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it gets thousands of visitors. So it was the, really a ton of exposure. Um, it, the way people walk through is kind of funny because nobody can take in so much work and they have to wait in line. So everybody kind of trudges through. There was kind of like a circle around that pillar and back out. Um, I was trying to create something nuanced and subtle and I don't know if it totally worked in, in, that, in that kind of um, event. But um, I also, in this case, um, all the lighting, so the, the bubbles were coming up through the floor and all the lighting for it, the show came from um, negative spaces or like, um, so above, you can't really see it, um, right above this cro <laughs> grody sink here, there was a, um, a lofted space that had an opening. And so I had all the light coming through that, through a grate above. And then there was also an open shaft that went like down into it, probably some kind of elevator shaft. It would also blow air out of it. Um, so there was air coming through there and light coming through there. So it was this idea of kind of um, alluding to the spaces that we can't access, um, which I thought was kind of interesting with a building that had such a large history to it. Um, yeah, just kind of a recap. I don't think I was necessarily approaching the same idea and I didn't realize what I was doing along the way, but at some point I kind of reflected on my work and realized that this just left presence and empty space um, was kind of happening throughout the whole thread. So um, I do think it's kind of interesting when your work kind of coalesces at some point. I think reflection is important to kind of um, find those moments of connection. 
Um, there was an excerpt from Roland Barthes' Mythologies. Um, I think this slide might be slightly out of order, actually. I'm not sure what I did here. I would have shown this probably closer to the, um, the first soap piece, but um, Roland Barthes wrote these, this beautiful set of essays about um, objects and culture. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit from this, this um, essay that he wrote. Excerpt from Soaps and Detergent. As for foam, it is well known that it signifies luxury. To begin with, it appears to lack any usefulness. Then its abundance, easy, almost infinite proliferation allows one to suppose there is substance from which it issues vigorous germ, a healthy and powerful essence, a great wealth of active elements in a small original form. Finally, it gratifies in the consumer tendency to imagine matter as something airy with which con contact is affected in a mode both of light and vertical, which is sought after like that of happiness, either in the gustatory category, foie gras, entrements, wine, in that of clothing, muslin, tulle, or that of soaps, a film star in her bath. Foam can even be a sign of a certain spirituality inasmuch as the spirit has the reputation of being able to make something out of nothing. Um, I just thought it was great the way that he kind of unpacked the the maybe um, consumer power of soap, but then also what it actually does. And that idea of um, starting as nothing and becoming nothing again and cleansing um, is something that I've been kind of playing with in a lot of those pieces with the bubbles. At one point I challenged myself in the studio, maybe because I'm not inclined necessarily toward, um, toward making machines, I, I'm always kind of like pushing myself when I'm making that kind of work. I thought, could I, could I actually make a piece that's not kinetic, but still has a dynamic thrust? Um, and this is what I came up with. Um, people ask my husband if he's scared of me or I, it's like a joke, right? Of course, but um, yeah, this kind of like overkill, like fly swatter, and then maybe the knife holding that up too. It has a lot of violence to it, but also maybe a level of humor as well. An artist that inspires that kind of work, um, Seal Floyer, this piece is called Solo, and it has a hairbrush installed on a microphone stand. I think she's saying a lot with very little, um, just a really funny and poignant um, piece right here. At one point, I was able to take my kitchen table series on the road. Um, literally, I said I wanted to do that, and my husband looked up uh, Winnebago, and so we took this little um, Winnebago. Uh, we bought it for a couple of years. It always like pretty much worked, um, <laughs> but it was a really fun way to travel, and um, I literally got to take the kitchen table down the road and see what would happen. Um, so a lot of times, the drawings kind of changed to be a little more um, like central focused. I didn't necessarily decide to do that, but you know, there, there was a space around me that was stationary um, and then everything else seemed like it was moving. It was just kind of interesting to see how like home on the road would translate into a drawing. There's another one. I think you can kind of see, um, I'm not finding my cursor, but like the, the white patch is the table that I'm sitting at. And then you can kind of just see how the marks um, filter in around that. Another one. This was called Round Trip. So this was a little more imagined of like all of the places that we went. Um, and it actually, this particular trip ended or started, um, we started at a funeral for my aunt and then it ended with my nephew being born. So this has kind of a personal significance to me as well. It's a piece y'all might be familiar with. Um, I made this piece for the first time during my um, residency at Three Walls. It's really fun to have access to a gallery space for a month um, while you're living in the space and you know what's behind the walls. Um, I actually, when Anthony and I were talking about whether or not this piece would be possible, I said, do you have access to the back of a wall? And he said, yes. And I said, you know, believe it or not, a lot of galleries do, you know, the way that they're built. We have prep rooms and that kind of thing often behind the wall. Um, and so, um, yeah, this idea again of kind of playing with um, noticing, um, maybe asking some questions about what art can be. Um, can it be ephemeral? Um, is it a mistake? Is it the hole left in the wall? 
Um, and then thinking about, you know, the space beyond the gallery as well, um, the space behind the wall and what, what could be happening there when these, these bubbles are coming out. I think I'm going a little bit too long, so I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. Um, okay, yeah, this is not a piece that I made, but I was inspired by the way that bugs moved as a swarm. Um, kind of thinking about the idea of interdependence and, you know, they're not touching each other, but they're being informed by the movement of the one next to them. Um, thought they were beautiful but agitating movements. And so I decided to make a sculpture about the swarm. And this one was installed at the Eli and Edith Road Art Museum. And I had to make this piece on site. Um, in retrospect, now that I know how to move them, I probably could have taken it home, but I didn't. Um, I just didn't think it would make it. So um, because the threads, it's kind of hard to see in the video, but because the threads are so um, connected to each other, they actually don't tangle very easily the same way like maybe a fishing net or a spider web or something like that um if you connect in the right way they actually kind of keep each other apart and create put the right tension and that's how the mobile is created i used um over the hill birthday candle wax so purposely thinking about um deterioration and um aging and kind of the way that that idea would play with um, flies as well. Um, so that piece was also installed at the same museum. Um, the architecture is very um, uneven in a, in a purposeful way, Zaha Hadid architecture. Um, and so these long lines, um, long gravitational lines coming through the space um, were really in contrast to the kind of this um, italicized architecture. And then um, I don't know if you noticed, but the balls tapped every other time. So the piece was a lot about line and space. So again, those ideas of negative space that I had been playing with. Um, and then the playfulness as well was kind of part of what I was thinking about there too. Um, the piece was inspired by a um, Pink Panther cartoon. For some reason, when this villain was trying to make some poison in his blender, he had to pull out his little paddleboard and um, tap his red ball. And I just, um, I had been really kind of uh, searching for a piece at that point. And I thought, wouldn't that be interesting to make the red ball bounce? So um, first I did one, then I did 10. This is what was up in the ceiling. I had to learn a lot once again <laughs> on, the, on the spot here to learn about potentiometers. And these, um, these are actually windshield wiper motors. They were getting a little bit warm after they ran a long time. So I added some fans to cool them down. So just a lot of problem solving um, to get this piece to work. Here's the other piece that you guys have at the gallery here. I thought it would be really beautiful to make wind as a puppet. Um, and then I made it and realized how uncanny it also is. Um, hopefully both at the same time. One reason I wanted to put two curtains into um, the gallery that you guys have is because it 
it emphasizes even further that it's not actual wind. Um, if you know one is blowing, you could maybe think that it's not, but then the wind would never blow them as differently as, as they're moving right now. Um, this piece is um, basically blankets that are breathing, um, if you want to <laughs> dumb it down a little bit. Um, and then installed on the wall, kind of continuing this idea of bugs um, and the way that I feel like um, I can kind of talk about mood. There was a little piece um, of black wax installed on a magnet that also went through the wall. Um, and so thinking about um, presence again, and then at the time my, my husband's um, grandfather was really ill, close to death, and everybody was just kind of sitting in the room watching, you know, it, are the blankets gonna go up again? So that I made this piece around that time with that feeling of just like, is it, is it gonna happen again? Is it gonna happen again? And then the fly just keeps moving on the wall next to it. A really sophisticated machine once again. Um, it's a set of rare earth magnets and some sinkers and then the, the motor's just pulling. And then I actually, um, I made that on site in the gallery. And so I like used soap to lubricate the wall because I was just kind of like making it as I went um, with whatever I had around me. Let's skip another one here. Um, this piece was also at the UICA. Um, I had made this as a single piece kind of inspired by um, Marilyn Monroe's skirt. I was at a wedding looking at a linen table and thinking about how funny it would be if you know that was kind of blowing up in the wind. And then I ended up making kind of the spinning version of that. So um, you can imagine these as sort of human um, dancers, maybe dervishes, um, thinking about invisible forces and air patterns um, made visible. Um, another piece installed in that same show, um, I got a little bit better at making this kind of misty thing that I always wanted to have happening, smoke. Um, this was just installed on the railing where you could overlook the um, spinning tables. And so this was another one that kind of caught people by surprise, just like the, um, the coffee cup. Um, in the bucket, I now am using a nebulizer, which is much simpler than all the other solutions I had come up with before. I do like in my work too, um, you can see that um, if you go down below or look over the edge, you can see exactly how this is being done. I guess you can't see the nebulizer, but I'm not hiding everything about the work. Um, I'm making it available from a different angle. So you can kind of have that reveal, see the, see the cigarette, wonder about it, but then you can kind of, um, I'm being honest with where things are at. I did another version of the swarms um, installed at PAR projects in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, in this piece, it was the inaugural show for PAR projects and we were talking about community and bringing a community together. Um, and so I installed eight of these swarms lower than I had at the Broad Art Museum. And they actually kind of um, materialize as you walk through the space. Um, they're really hard to see if they're not lit um, or if you're not seeing it with the, the lit wall behind it. Um, so you had to proceed carefully and kind of think about your body within the space, which was kind of what I was hoping people would have to do, right? Because we're talking about how people relate to each other and relate to um, a community. These are impossible to document too, of course, because they're all about experience. Um, drawing kind of, um, continues to change. In this case, I started drawing some of my, my small sculptures. So I'd kind of make these like material playful things and then I was rendering them. Um, this was for a show called Doubled Over. So I was kind of thinking about the iterative process of making and how you can you know make something and then you can make a version of it, make photograph it, and maybe you translate it into another medium. Um, so this was kind of the double of the, the sculptures. There's a series here. So were really fun to make after doing kitchen table series for such a long time because they were just so different. And then this was also from that same show called Doubled Over. Um, in this case, the, the household object of the lamp, which kind of relates to the body, is doubled over. 
and I like to kind of explore like the the double meaning of that and how you know it could be laughing so hard it can't stand up or it could be in total agony or pain another time I didn't have to use a motor either which was kind of um it's a relief every once in a while I'm going to skip this one because I have this in another slide later I did another version of thin air um, for an exhibition at Washington Pavilion in um, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And so there was, um, well, how many did we end up doing? I think there was eight or nine of them in this space. They were freestanding. So similar ideas, but just playing with, you know, the more immersive experience and the, the version where um, people can kind of move through the space rather than look at this kind of photographic, um, almost like GIF moment, um, like the other ones are, it becomes more something to wander through. I had a show um, right before the pandemic started. So this was at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and the, the show was called Sink In. So this was kind of like the cover piece for this. This piece was inspired um, literally by maybe a little bit of the mess that I sometimes live in. Um, my dresser, it was kind of a tall skinny dresser and the drawers were open in this kind of cascading style. And then an item of clothing was kind of like hanging over the edge. And I was like, it kind of looks like a waterfall. Um, and so I, this was another one where like the idea came first and I chased it with everything in me. Um, sealing something old um that's wooden that doesn't want to be filled with water <laughs> was such a pain i did all kinds of like my own solutions and then in the end when it was getting close to the show and i really wanted it in i ended up going to um a place nearby where they do they spray truck beds um and so i had this like polyura coating um sprayed into them and then they they became more like a, a bucket which also reinforced them because there's so much weight um in the water for these pieces. Um, but it was really, um, I'm really proud of that piece as much as trouble as it gave me. I mean, I think it was like six months of problem solving to get this thing to work, all kinds of refinishing and, you know, getting the water to run just right. Um, but it was really um, pretty much exactly what I had imagined in the end. Um, during the pandemic, I did another series of the swarms, but I made this one for my neighbors. <laughs> um, this is when Michigan was in shelter in place. Um, and I, in one of our outbuildings, I made an installation similar to the one in Cleveland um, because the ideas were so transferable and I wanted to make something for the people around me. Um, so this was, this was a um, exhibition for solitary viewing. Um, you were supposed to go in alone, not with anybody else. Um, and then move through the space and the swarms were about six feet apart. So kind of just thinking about um, how, how the movement of one person could affect, or sorry, one dot, uh, one of these flies in the swarm affects the movement of everyone else and kind of how that would translate to the idea of, you know, us during this pandemic. Um, and then also, like I said, they were six feet apart. So as the person moved through the space and they weren't lit, um, well on purpose so that you had to kind of walk, walk contempl contemplatively through the space. Um, that was just open for a month um, in May of 2020. I also, um, the pandemic drawing series here is a scatter plot series. I did some of the kitchen table as well, um, but I, I had this little bag of studio detritus. Um, you might 
guess that I carry a lot of things around with me based on how I make work. That's true. Um, in this case, it was a bag of items that I thought looked interesting and that they were all very small. So I think there's like a doll eyelash there. There's like a piece of popcorn. There's these little um, baked grass pieces. Um, a shell from maybe like a like a avocado pit was in there, um, some pieces of pink wax from a birthday candle. So just all this like colors and shapes that I was interested in. Um, and then I would scatter them onto the paper and render them right below where I had kind of like thrown the stuff down um, like this. So you can see the actual object. Um, I don't think I know where my cursor is, unfortunately. But if you look at the black object on the left side, um, the top is the plastic piece and the bottom is where I'm rendering it. So the whole, the whole scattering got kind of translated maybe like uh, three quarters of an inch below. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily conceive of it as this, but the more I made it, it felt really related to what we were doing when we were in shelter in place, just because it, um, there was a permanence and a, um, just kind of a an, uh, randomness to where everything landed. So I went arrange everything, but then I, accepted their composition and kind of um, treated these overlooked kind of pieces of garbage basically that I thought looked interesting as um, their position as permanent and kind of gave them this this attention. So I created a series of I think nine or so of drawings like this um, that yeah I, I think it was a hard time to make art. Um, I didn't have access to my studio or anything like that. Um, I have two little kids they were like at home from school, I was trying to teach. And so I, I kind of forced myself to make work in the middle of all these layers of life and just hoping that, you know, something kind of came of that. And I do feel like um, some of that moment in time was captured in, in this drawing series. Um, the last piece I'll show you, um, so I showed the scatter plot series at the Saugatuck Center for the Arts in February um, and then elaborated on the sculpture that I had made before, um, these little towels on the floor. They all moved a little bit differently. definitely like a personality to each of them. Um, they all moved a little bit differently. There was two different kinds of motors I used, but then I built each one a little bit different. Um, and just this idea of kind of like putting your head down and getting work done over and over. Although in this case, it's like entirely absurd because they're not actually cleaning anything, um, but they're, they're working really hard at it in, in the process. So um, that is the last slide that I have for you guys. Um, definitely open to questions or um, revisiting any of the work that you would like to see more of. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was, that was really wonderful. Um, we do have, we do have some questions already that have appeared in the chat. And uh, so I'll go ahead and ask those. And if anyone in the audience still has additional questions, feel free to continue to type them in there. Um, so the first question is one that I also was wondering as, as someone who worked on on the installation with you, which is um, your work and thoughts seem to be really tied to reacting to the site, you know, being really site specific. Um, and so the question is, how do you feel about, um, you know, this new world that we're living in where you're not able to be there to install the work yourself? Mm-hmm. I, I actually do love installing my work. Um, however, that is really limiting to what I can do. So I've, I've challenged myself. Um, I do give myself a lot of challenges in the studio. I see that as a way to, you know, expand where my work can go. So I have a goal of, you know, kind of keeping hopefully a lot of that life and that, um, I, I'd say there may be more site reactive than site specific. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that they would relate to, you know, the site at Transy has been considered, um, 
but I wasn't there to like see it and actually, I mean, I'd, I'd prefer to probably just like measure the string once I hang the motor, right? But um, in this case, we kind of had to do it a little bit differently. So um, I wish I could always install my shows, but I also, I'm hoping I can do a little bit more um, shipping and, you know, getting my work further away when I don't have a whole week to give up to go travel somewhere and, and do that, so. Yeah, that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Anthony did a great job, by the way. He's one of the first um, <laughs> a curator, preparator, whatever, um, to install these kinds of pieces without me there. So I really appreciate that. Thanks. It was it was fun to kind of be within your studio practice for a moment. You definitely had to be. <laughs> and I, I felt like I learned a lot, especially about thin air. Um, I was so nervous installing that piece where I'm sure that as you're installing it, you're like, oh, well, you know, if something snaps or whatever, I'll fix it. And I'm like, if, if something, if one of those tiny little, you know, thin lines breaks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be terrified. You know? <laughs> um, and I was so concerned about it, them getting tangled and you were like, oh, don't even worry about it. And I started to learn like, oh, because of the apparatus, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was very interesting to be inside Lisa's head for a moment a little bit. I have to rediscover those things often too. If I don't take like great notes or something, I'll go back to a piece and I'm like, what did I do? Like there is, it's like kind of um, a lot of on the spot problem solving. So yeah. That makes sense. Um, Aaron asks within maybe it's supposed to, the temporary nature of the bubbles, um, is that part of the meaning of the work to you or is it simply an obstacle that you had to work around? Interesting. Um, definitely part of the content. And if I didn't say that the first time around, um, I think I sometimes focus on that kind of um, illusion through the wall, right? Like we always think about what we put on the gallery walls. And I like to think about, you know, maybe making people wonder what's behind it. Um, but yeah, the temporary versus permanent nature of art, um, I like to ask that question as well. Um, and the fact that they're constantly popping and changing and not stationary. Um, it's definitely a huge part of my interest with that that piece to the content. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I was wondering when, so obviously there's a lot of play in your work, you mm. know? Um, and so when you're in the studio and you're making, you know, some pieces you talked about, I had a plan, I went into it, you know, with this, this specific thing in mind, but then all the times you were kind of saying, you know, this happens and I just am reacting to, you know, how, how it's going. So I guess how much are you planning and how much are you playing within the studio? I talk to my students about that a lot because I do think I've um, I've understood how important planning is for the success of my work or for it to translate to a wider audience. I mean, I could I could manipulate materials and play with objects all day long. I love doing that, but I'm not sure anything ever really gets done. So I think it's it's a really fine balance for me between those two things. Um, you know, kind of stepping back and I've the drawing process actually helps a lot um I think more recently I've been because I have limited time in the studio which isn't very um good for the playful exploration that and chances of failure that I'd like to be able to have in my studio you know when you show up and you have a certain amount of time to work um I've been trying to do some of that problem solving and reflection at home through drawing mm -hmm. um and and even just some photography where you kind of like take an image of the work and understand it better and come back with a plan. So like allowing the play to happen, but then inserting these kind of reflection processes throughout. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you're just talking about, you know, sometimes you photograph your work during the process of making. Somebody has asked if you do your own documentation of your work after it's you know, completely realized. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I used to do photography, so the the videos and stuff, that's actually a really fun part of it for me. <laughs> I like kind of uh, highlighting the drama of what I've um, created, I guess. So yeah, I do all my own documentation. That makes sense. And the, some of the work is you know very ephemeral in nature. So I feel like you have a, it starts to be your voice that comes through in what we see if it's not in the gallery with us at that exact moment. Yeah. yeah me it feels really important that you do that documentation i have had other people document my work and it is interesting to see what they highlight right and i maybe even learned something about 
you know, their vision of the piece. Um, but I, I do enjoy doing my own for sure. Yeah. So um, Frank Geiser, who's another one of the artists that is in Subtle, uh, has a question and he's asking, Aaron, you refer to your work as a gift moment at one point. Um, when you're conceptualizing your work, do you think of elements of loop? It seems like there's a constant movement in your work. And I'm curious if you ever relate to digital experiences or if you think of your ephemeral work in digital space. That's a really good question. Um, I do think about the loop a lot. Like I think of them almost as like moving photographs in my mind or something like that, right? Um, and a lot of them, I have made gifts out of them and it works perfectly, right? Because they're all, you know, many of them are on this kind of like three second to 10 second um, turnaround. And I think I like, it's not the only way to make my work, but I do like the way that that kind of encourages uh, like a meditative viewing experience because um, you're just seeing this repeated over and over and you might understand it differently um, as you take in that experience multiple times. Mm -hmm. I didn't really address digital space as much. Um, I'd like to think about that more, I think. I don't know if I've thought about that a ton. Yeah. Sure. That makes sense. Um, kind of getting at the, those motors, Gavin asks, I noticed that you use a lot of motors in your work. Um, why is it that you're drawn to using motors? Or I guess, how did that come to be? Yeah. I think that moment um, towards the beginning of my, you know, I, d I definitely showed you guys over a decade of, you know, this kind of uh, studio experience. But for a long time, I was chasing the idea of, um, transients or this thing in between this intangible thing but then I was um, showing it with things that were concrete or maybe like the carcass of some kind of action um, so the minute I started making things move just felt like such an aha moment where I was able to embody you know this this um, ephemeral nature that I was talking about um, so I think I think I'm just really interested in these these spaces between and these things that you can't necessarily hold on to um, and the movement kind of gives me that. So I wouldn't say it's my favorite. Like I said, I would love to manipulate materials all day long. Um, there's a lot more problem solving and um, engineering involved with the, the motors. I think I like that work probably better most of the time, but I think I'd almost prefer to, like I'm fighting a little bit against um, my, my tendencies in the studio, probably in a healthy way, right? But I'm, I'm pushing myself um, in that direction a bit, so. Sense. Um, so one thing that I noticed in the gallery, you know, is that the motors give this kind of sound element where you, you hear the motors, you know, it's very soft, you know, but there's, it becomes kind of part of the piece. And Kaylin is asking if you think about including other sounds in your work or an absence of it, you know, in that anything having to do with sound, I guess, really. Yeah, yeah. The last piece I showed, the um, it was called Tight Spots with the 14 um, rags. Those had pretty loud motors. Those were actually um, like the, the windshield wiper motors, most of them. And so it was like this grinding noise, which felt really appropriate actually for the action, right? It sounded almost like a factory in there um, as these little towels absurdly scrubbed the floor. Um, I do think about sound with my work. Um, I think you and I even talked about a, an idea I had for like kind of like a knocking on the other side of the, um, it didn't work for the show because there was other sound pieces, but yeah, I, I would like to do more with sound um, or the absence of sound I think is really beautiful too. I think there is a stillness and a quietness in a lot of the work, but um, yeah, that, that would be something to explore further as well. It's a good question. I remember seeing when you're, when you had the, I can't remember the exact name of the piece, but the balls, um, mm -hmm. the road, and being in that space with those. Um, and there was, I feel like you were getting at both sound and absence within that piece because you would get that moment where it struck the ground and you get the bounce back up or the illusion of it bouncing back up. And then it would go down its next time and you're anticipating the sound because you're so familiar with it. And then it, since it doesn't actually hit, then it just be, it, it reinforces that absence of sound in a way that was really like almost jarring because mm -hmm. 
you so expect it, so understand the bouncing of a ball to then not have that happen. Um, it's, it just created so much surprise. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you brought that piece up. That was a piece, you know, the, the tapping was definitely a huge part of um, what I was playing with. And then, yeah, that expectation. So it's the, the presence and the absence. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, another member of the attendants asked, I noticed a lot of your work, there's an exploration of familiar or maybe even mundane spaces. What inspires you about those spaces or alternatively, what insights do you think can be extracted from these moments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's been important to me for some reason. And I think it's just maybe where my personal work comes from that like a lot of the inspiration does come from my own space. Um, but then when I'm choosing the objects for the sculptures themselves, like the lamp or the dresser or, um, you know, various items, I really try to choose the thing that's, or I guess the white tablecloth too, like the most um, generic version of the object so that it is relatable to the viewer. So I'm, I'm kind of starting with the familiar, and I think Anthony, your introduction kind of alluded to this. There's a connection, um, hopefully already there a little bit. You see something that you know, but then I change kind of the way I try to change the way that you think about it, right? So then you have to kind of reconsider your assumptions a little bit. That's a lot of sense. That's a train going by my studio, sorry. It's really loud. And actually that, um, that train might be there to inform us that that is both the last question and it is uh, seven o'clock and I wanna be respectful of your time. But Lisa, thank you so much for your wonderful work and, and insights tonight and joining us tonight and for exhibiting and subtle. Um, it's been really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And thanks for all the good questions, everybody. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, if you haven't seen Subtle in Moreland Gallery, please head on over and uh, we will tell you all to have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Lisa. Good night.